Hi, my name is Michael Osman. I'm President and CEO of Osman Aquatic Safety Consulting. My firm specializes in investigating drowning and near drowning events, providing educational workshops, as well as providing litigation support services to the legal community. Today's message, which is brought to you by the Pool Management Group, is to talk about shallow water blackout. Many of us may have heard of this before. For those of you who haven't, diluting it down to its primary essence, shallow water blackout is the act of prolonged underwater breath holding by either swimming lengths underwater or engaging in a static breath hold that results in unconsciousness and commonly which results in death. I've investigated approximately 20 different shallow water blackout events. Many of those have resulted into fatalities. For those that didn't, and there was intervention in a window of time which was able to produce spontaneous respirations in the victim, I've had the opportunity to talk to the person who engaged in that activity. And in each and every one of those, the question that was begged is, what did it feel like when you engaged in this activity? The person typically says, well, I was hyperventilating before I did it. I swam as far as I could. And the next thing I realized when I thought that I was continuing to swim underwater, I woke up on the side of the pool with someone compressing on my chest or blowing into my mouth. They don't realize it's going to happen. And that is a critical factor that I need all of you to understand. This isn't an activity that you feel coming on. And we don't feel it because of what we do as a precursor to the activity. Typically, we hyperventilate. We inhale. We exhale multiple times. And in the process of doing that, we're blowing down our carbon dioxide. Right now, if each and every one of us was to take a deep breath of air and hold it and see how long we could hold our breath, some of us may hold our breath for a minute to maybe three minutes, but inevitably we'd get to a point where we'd be forced to take a breath. And that's triggered internally by our blood chemistry. The carbon dioxide reaching that threshold, forcing our body to take a breath. When we blow that carbon dioxide down and we engage in that same activity, we don't reach that threshold of forcing the breath and instead we reach that threshold which is the second self-preservation method and that's shutting our body down i.e. going unconscious and when that happens in a swimming pool the results typically are catastrophic when that person does pass out and go unconscious in the swimming pool because it's acute because it's silent there isn't the traditional critical signals that lifeguards are trained to look for we don't see the struggling of that victim at the surface it's quiet the person descends down to the bottom of the swimming pool and is there until someone sees it and intervenes and because of surface agitation because of reflection refraction glare identifying that person on the bottom of the pool from a lifeguard perspective which is commonly removed and distill from the event becomes catastrophically more difficult to do and also results commonly in a fatality. We then have the swimmers who are there who are engaging in the activity, swimming around, hanging out in the swimming pool. They're the ones who typically see it, but because their eyes are often fooled by their expectations, they don't raise that alarm early enough in the process. In interviewing many of these folks who see it, they say, when I saw the person floating there or just below the surface of the water with their arms bent looking down at their watch, I thought that they were continuing to do what I saw them doing earlier, which is hold their breath. Or when I saw them swimming laps underwater and the next thing I saw, I saw them on the bottom of the pool, I assumed that they were continuing that breath hold and simply doing it in a static position. So I did not respond. For those of you who are watching this message today, if you take anything from this, I want two things to be extracted from this discussion. Number one, let's stop this activity of underwater breath holding. There's no medical evidence that shows that by swimming lengths under the water, we are expanding our lung capacity any more than by swimming at the surface of the pool or engaging in other cardiovascular exercises. Secondly, Number one, let's stop it. Number two, when we see someone who is there and unmoving in a swimming pool, don't dismiss it for them just playing, doing a dead man float, or seeing what they can do by holding their breath under the water. Immediately investigate it. Bring them up. And at worst case, that person then will tell you, hey, what are you doing? I was just holding my breath. And at that point, we use that opportunity to educate them. Don't do this because it could result in death. So. One, let's stop this activity from taking place. And two, when we see something, don't dismiss it, but investigate it, identify what it is, and hopefully in the process, we are gonna be able to save a person's life by acting aggressively and proactively in that situation. 
Finally, to you, those of you who are lifeguards and watching this message, don't allow this to take place in your swimming pool. As managers and operators of swimming pools, put signs up around your swimming pool that advise against underwater breath holding, no prolonged breath holding. Put it in your rules and make sure that we're enforcing what those rules are. We all have the opportunity to save lives and this is an excellent way by educating, prohibiting, and making sure we don't allow this to take place. Thank you for your time. Good luck.